Bonjour and welcome back to the history of the United States since 1877. In the last section, we spent quite a bit of time overseas as we explored World War II, the Cold War, and the Korean War. In this section, we're going to head back to American shores as we explore the different changes that took place in American society throughout the 1950s and 1960s. And there are three major developments happening in American society at the time. First is the desire to have greater social equality, and that would be the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson. The second one would be a struggle for racial equality, and that would be the Civil Rights Movement. And the third big development is a desire to have a greater equality between men and women, and that would be the Feminist Movement. We'll study all three in turn, and for each of these topics, I'll start with kind of the before shot and then the after shot. So today we'll start with 1950s society, and what happened to it in terms of uh, poverty and youth rebellion, and then we can move on to Kennedy and Johnson next time. Pay close attention because a lot of the debates that we have nowadays, whether it's on topic like affirmative action or abortion and many other topics, they are directly related to the cultural wars of the 1960s. So 1950s society it is. By and large, this was a conservative decade. And in this class, we've studied some decades that were more conservative, like the 1920s, and others that were more liberal, like the 1930s, and well, the 50s and 60s, I guess, would be another pair, conservative in the 50s and much more liberal in the 60s. The president who oversaw most of that decade would be Dwight D. Eisenhower, elected president in 52 after Harry Truman, served two terms, a very popular president, and so he would leave office in January of 61 when Kennedy came along. Uh, we've encountered him before. He was briefly involved in kicking out the veterans out of Washington during the infamous Bonus Army episode of 1932, and then far more gloriously was involved in planning Operation Overlord, the D-Day landings in Normandy in 1944. Then after World War II, he briefly oversaw NATO, which was a big anti-communist alliance, and then, uh, as an older man, uh, president of the U.S. for two terms. As a president, he was popular, but also is often associated with a sense of uh, complacency, that things are perfect in American society, that the U.S. is richer than any other country in the world, there is no reform to be made, and that's true of many older people. They don't want to change things because, well, they're old. Uh, you don't see that many revolutionaries on the barricades uh, with gray hair. He was married to an old woman, obviously. Her name was Mami Eisenhower. And the image that the people had uh, around the country was that he was that nice grandfatherly figure who liked to go and play golf. Some of it was not quite accurate now that we have access to all the uh, documents that have been declassified, realized that it was far more hands-on behind the scenes, but that's the public image uh, that he had. So a sense that you don't want to change things, and that's what complacency is. You're happy with things as they are, and you don't want to change them. Uh, beyond that, it's a rather conservative uh, administration. He was a Republican, so all the things that I've mentioned in previous lectures about being small government, a uh, desire uh, to be pro-business, that applies to him as well. One of the prominent members of his cabinet was a man called Charles Wilson, who before that had been the president of General Motors, which back then was the largest corporation in America. And when he was Secretary of Defense, which was his job in the Eisenhower administration, it was never quite clear what was most important to him, uh, defending American businesses like GM or serving the interests of the public as a member of a cabinet. He's famously quoted as saying, what is good for GM is good for America. Another ism uh, that is associated with the 1950s would be materialism, meaning that you focus uh, too much on material goods. And it has to do uh, with the kind of trauma that the generation that was an adult generation in the 1950s had to go through. These are people that grew up as kids during the Great Depression, so obviously were lacking for everything. And then by the 1940s were dispatched to World War II if they were men, or as uh, women uh, remain in the U.S., uh, probably found a job during the 1940s, but also could not spend much money because it's an era of rationing. So by the time you get to the 1950s, finally they have all that pent-up savings and a desire to, to buy goods, and they do that a lot. Uh, they buy their suburbs, they buy their car, they buy electric appliances, and they're happy with that because they had all the excitement that they could ever dream of during the 30s and 40s, and now they just want to relax. Uh, big business is developing, so a lot of people are now white-collar workers in a large corporation. And if you're interested in seeing a person like this, uh, I would recommend watching The Apartment, which is a great 
great comedy from the 50s, one of my favorite comedies, and it is set uh, in a big insurance company in New York City. And what you do is that you wake up in the morning and you take your car to go to work and you have to show up there at 8 a.m. sharp because that's what your boss tells you to do and you have a cup of coffee at 10 a.m. because, well, that's what your company tells you to do and so forth all day long. And by the end of the day at 5 p.m. you come home because, again, that's what the clock tells you. And why do you buy that product? Because the companies uh, told you what to do. And throughout, you are in what is called the rat race. Like all the other rats, you're in the maze looking for the cheese. Or another expression from the time would be to keep up with the Joneses. And there's something great about it. It's always good to have a nice car and a nice house and so forth. But to a younger generation, as we'll see in a minute, uh, it's a bit frustrating. Another adjective that you can use to describe the 1950s would be conformism. People don't want to stick out. People want to be the same. We saw some of that process begin as early as the 1920s, where more and more people buy radio sets, and so they listen to the same radio shows coming from Chicago or New York. And also because of the development of cars, people travel around much, and American society becomes more uniform. That process is accelerated in the 1950s. Now the radio has been replaced by the TV, which has the same impact. Car culture also becomes more ingrained in the 1950s. It used to be that many Americans lived in the downtown of big cities within walking distance of their job or their shop, and if they had to move somewhere further away, they would use public transportations. Most American cities of a given size would have a tramway line. Well, after World War II, many car manufacturers like, say, GM or Chrysler began buying those tramway lines. And you might ask yourself, how come they are in the business of public transportation? Well, the reason is that after buying those primary lines, they shut them down, and then that forced people to do one thing, and that was to buy a car from GM or Chrysler, and that forced people to transition to the new era of car transportation. President Eisenhower accelerated this process when he began the interstate highway system. Why was he interested in that? Well, in large part because of his experience in uh, World War II in, in Germany. Uh, when he had occupied Germany, Eisenhower had noticed that there was a big interstate system, they called that the Autobahn over there. It had been built by uh, Hitler. And he was impressed by it and thought he wanted to do the same thing back in the US. And even though it was a small government conservative in that one era, he wanted to spend quite a bit of money in a huge government program to have interstates all over the place. And the way he sold it to the uh, Republican members of the House was that this would be a defense system. Technically, this was done to allow the US Army to move troops around the country uh, more easily. Although in practice, the purpose that it was used for in everyday life is quite different. It is uh, to allow people to move away uh, from the downtown and buy cheap land outside of the big cities. And now that you have an interstate, you can zoom in and out of the city where you have the office in maybe 10, 20, 30 minutes. And uh, the whole concept of suburbia, uh, that's a legacy of the 1950s. Uh, the first one historically was a place called Levitt Town, which is in New Jersey, just outside New York City. And the whole idea there was to use the principles of mass production and the assembly line process, uh, but to the building of houses. So instead of having a one-of-a-kind house with specific plans set up by an architect and specialized craftsmen to build the house, which would be quite expensive, you would have one set of plans that would apply to thousands of houses, and you would uh, get all the pieces delivered on site, and everything would be built in a record time and every other house in the neighborhood would be built exactly the same way. You might be able to pick the paint or maybe the doorknob, and that's about it. So if you come home late at night and you're drunk, and people drink quite a bit in the 1950s, as you know from watching uh, that great series, Mad Men, which is also set uh, in New York City and the suburbs in the 50s, uh, well, you'd better not be too drunk because every single house in the neighborhood looks exactly the same. So people live in the same houses, they have similar types of jobs, in a way they start to look the same because you have to fit in. Those suburban developments are usually uh, catering to a very specific social class, that if it's a house that's worth, I don't know, $50,000, it appeals to that kind of uh, professional. You also have less racial mixity because uh, it is before the civil rights movement, so many of these housing developments are segregated by race, that black families cannot move in into a white neighborhood. So everybody around you is pretty much the exact same thing. White, same level of income, and you definitely don't want to stick out. This is a conformist era. The, I remember watching a documentary on the 50s where a young boy was interviewed and asked, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? The classic question to ask of a young boy. And specifically, do you want to be an astronaut? Because that's the 50s, the space race is in. And he thought about it for a while and then responded, well, I'd love to be an astronaut. 
if everybody else was an astronaut and he had really internalized the concept of 50s, do everything like everybody else, even when it comes to fulfilling your dreams and being an astronaut. Uh, one sociologist who studied that issue was David Reisman, the author of The Lonely Crowd. In that book, he made a distinction between being inner directed and outer directed. In that case, that has nothing to do with your belly button. It means more the way your brain works. And in the book, Reisman argued that Americans used to be inner directed, meaning that they took decisions based on their own will. And you go back to the stereotype of the cowboy or the settler on the frontier who is alone in the wild. The government is not telling him or her what to do. And so if they want to wake up that day at that time or go in that direction, they do it purely out of free will. By the 1950s, I mentioned earlier, well, you don't do things out of free will. You wake up in the morning at a specific time because your boss tells you to do. So uh, you get married at that age because there's a social pressure to do so. And you buy that product because you're bombarded with ads on the TV. So you're now outer directed. Your decisions come from the society that you live in. Well, many people were willing to embrace those values of the 1950s, especially, as I mentioned, people who had suffered through the Great Depression and World War II. It's a golden cage, and it's pretty happy to be in there. But you have some younger people who are not too happy with that, and that's kind of a general rule in society that the young people are the ones who want to shake it up. And we're usually accustomed to the rebels of the 1960s, a hippie generation and such, uh, but there are some already in the 1950s. Among the critics of 1950s society would be a man called Michael Harrington, the, uh, the author of The Other American. And in this book, he mentioned that it's true that American society was more prosperous than it had ever been. On the other hand, he argued that the prosperity was not quite spread as widely as you would want. Uh, to some extent, there is quite a lot of equality in the 1950s, far more than today, because the income tax rate is pretty high. There are a lot of industrial jobs out there, and they pay fairly well. So most people are living a pretty solid middle-class life, even more so than today. But there would be still, and that's where Michael Harrison comes in, a kind of incompressible uh, rate of poverty of about 20% of the population. And he said that if you went to a remote valley in Appalachia, or maybe places in the Mississippi Delta, or maybe an Indian reservation in Oklahoma, you would encounter a world there that was quite different from the world of Levittown, New Jersey. You call that the other America. The way that calls back to some of the muckrakers that we studied in the progressive era, especially, especially Jacob Rees, who had talked about uh, how the other half lives, and he had also argued that there were poor people even in a period of prosperity. So that book was widely read, and it was kind of a call to arms to uh, more progressive figures in the 50s and 60s to do something about that. If America was so prosperous, why couldn't it devote a bit of that wealth uh, to making sure that every citizen lived well? And that will be kind of the basis for what we see in the next lecture, uh, which is the uh, war on poverty of Lyndon Johnson. You also have a number of young people who have a hard time fitting in. Uh, well, some people do fit in. I mean, they're, they're square, and so by uh, 18, uh, they go to college if they can have the means to, or they get a job and they get married early, and they're just perfectly fine. But you have some other people that want to experiment a bit more because, well, they're 18, and if they don't do crazy things now, they'll never will. And they'd love to experiment and do crazy things, but they can't because it's a very conforming society where you are told, get a job, move into the suburbs, follow what your boss is telling you to do, don't stick out, and get married very young and start cranking out those kids. And those unhappy young people are quite numerous because this is the era of the baby boom. Uh, the baby boom in that case would refer to the fact that the birth rate among Americans in the 50s and 60s is very, very high, as you can see from that graph. Normally, if you have a society that keeps getting richer, the birth rate has a tendency to go down to maybe 1.5 to 2 children per woman. That's the general trend uh, across the world. In the U.S., however, uh, the rule did not apply in the 50s. Uh, what had happened is that the birth rate had declined a lot in the 30s because of the hardship of the Great Depression. People were unwilling to have kids because they could not afford. And then the birth rate had remained low in the 1940s because it's also a period of turmoil, uh, the uh, World War II. And in fact, a lot of couples are separated with the men being uh, overseas fighting. But by 45, 46, when America demobilized and all the veterans returned home, well, they get married. And I won't go into all the details about the birds and the bees. You're going to have to fill in the details. But nine months later, all the babies are born. And so you have a skyrocketing birth rate. And that remained pretty high throughout the late 40s, 50s, and 60s. Part of it is also connected to the fact that women get married very young, that initially contraception is illegal. Uh, 
And so um, many women are just stuck having kids whether they want to or not. I will get back to it when we study the feminist movement. Another development reflecting the youth in the 1950s is the growth of teenage delinquency, meaning that uh, young kids get into trouble, and not necessarily huge trouble, more like stealing cars, getting into a bar fight, that kind of stuff, but it's still delinquency. And many of the parents are wondering about that, and in fact they look at their kids as being brats, because remember, these are parents that went through the Great Depression, that went through World War II, and their kids had it much easier. They grew up in the suburbs, and they had a car when they turned 16, and everything that money could buy, and then somehow they get into trouble. A good example of that would be the character played by James Dean in the classic movie Rebel Without a Cause, uh, where he is following his parents, I think it's set in California, not far from LA, and he has everything that money can buy, but he gets into trouble, and specifically this is a very classic scene, where they play chicken, they steal cars, and then they race the cars toward the cliff to figure out who will be chicken and will jump out of the car uh, first. Great, great movie. Also on the topic of movie, the other big icon from the 1950s would be Marlon Brando, uh, specifically a movie called The Wild One, where he's there as part of a gang of bikers that terrorize a small town again in California. Uh, these are the two big hunks uh, from the period noticed, a tight-fitting white t-shirt, Marlon Brando also was big in a streetcar named Desire and also in On the Waterfront, which is another great movie. But the point I'm making there is that those two icons for young people, you notice that they're playing bad boy roles. So what's wrong with those young people that commit all these crimes as the older people? And plenty of explanations are given. Uh, some people blame uh, the fact that some women have jobs and so they neglect their kids and they don't raise them well enough, so you kind of blame the mother in that case. Some people blame comic books, which are very popular, and they think that these are not giving a good uh, role model to young kids. One person we came up with a more convincing theory would be the sociologist Paul Goodman in a book called Growing Up Absurd. And studying those teenage delinquents, he noticed that these are people that had a hard time fitting in, uh, that they were told from very early on, get a job, get married, get that house in the suburb, and they just didn't want to do it. And that's their way of rebelling against the straight jacket that 1950s society is about. And even though a majority of people in the 50s have a tendency to fit in, because that's what they're told, uh, you do have a few rebels, uh, specifically uh, the beat generation, or the beatniks. These people would be people like Jack Kerouac, another French-American, uh, lived in New York City, and uh, he was not too happy there. He lived with his mom, and was just bored out of his mind. And at some point, he decided to just uh, go out and leave. And he hopped onto a Greyhound bus, and then he went to Chicago and lived in a kind of a commune there for a while, and had different affairs with women that he was not married to, and tried alcohol and drugs, and then got bored after a while, and then hopped onto another bus to San Francisco, and just went from big city to big city. And that's what those beat do. They are people on the move. They're never happy where they are. They would remind you of the lost generation, uh, those unhappy intellectuals of the 20s that we had studied in an earlier lecture. Jack Kerouac eventually went back to New York City and just sat at his typewriter, got a very long ream of paper, and decided, let's just write a novel about my experiences. And that became the American classic On the Road, which I highly recommend that you read. It has a nice breathless flow to it, because it was written supposedly in one sitting, uh, that Kerouac had taken like uh, a gallon of coffee and two packs of cigarettes, and I just typed the whole thing in one uh, state. If you want to look at the manuscript, it has been preserved. It was actually sold for auction something like 10, 20 years ago for an ungodly amount of several million dollars. Or you can get the much cheaper version to get the Penguin edition or something, where for five or ten dollars you can still read that great classic, On the Road by Jack Kerouac. So keep all these issues in mind, because by the time we get to the second half of this lecture, a lot of the reformers in the 1960s will respond to those demands by the baby boomers to have a society that is more open, and also that caters more to the need of the poor. And that's what John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson would be about. And I want to finish by talking about the activism of young people, because that will be a big theme uh, throughout the baby boom generation, uh, either the beatniks uh, of today, or later on, uh, the more active anti-war activists of the late 60s and so forth. Because it's a rule, traditionally, that many young people don't act as much in politics as they should, and they should. I've noticed that with my students, that many of them don't vote, and they should, because in the 70s, in order to cater to young people, uh, there was an amendment to the Constitution to lower the voting age from 21 to 18, so you can vote, and most people who are young don't vote, and that means that all people who do vote kind of set the stage 
uh, for national politics. And so politicians who only cater to their voters will say, let's talk about Social Security and Medicare and all people's stuff and never pay attention to what is important to you. So pick an issue that you are passionate about and act on it. If the thing that does concern you will be school shootings, well, take a stand on that because old people won't go to school so they don't care about it. Or if that issue is global warming, well, act on it because all politicians, they'll be dead long before the planet heats up and they don't care about it. Or if your issue is student debt, well, again, all people could care less about the fact that college is far more expensive today than it was back in the 60s when they, as baby boomers, went to college. Or if your issue is contraception or abortion, well, act upon it because, again, people in their 60s and 70s, they could care less about it. They're not going to get pregnant anytime soon. Or if your issue is reining in the national debt, again, old people will never have to pay back all that money. You will, so they don't care about that. Or if you are more interested in staying home, eating Doritos, and watching whatever is on Netflix, well, do that. It's a free country, and you can be politically apathetic if you want. It would be a shame after studying so much U.S. history uh, that you don't have an opinion of your own. Well, that's it for my rant today. And next time we'll talk about the activism of the 1960s. Au revoir and goodbye.